Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's very special best practices webinar, Executive Roundtable 1. Now, when you first registered, you may not have seen that one before. I'll go into a little more detail about why there's a one there in a moment. But we have transportation leaders from both on the national level as well as state level. We're really excited. We have a lot of issues we're going to be covering, and um, I think it's going to resonate with all of you. And I'm hoping also that you will participate. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But first, without further ado, I want to welcome TransFinders President and CEO, Antonio Civitella. Tony, welcome to the podcast. Hey, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, it's a little chilly. I actually had to wear my long sleeve TransFinders shirt today. So, uh, but it's okay. Uh, wow. Exciting, very special webinar here today. Uh, we're going to be featuring some great state and national leaders. I got to tell you, I always ask everybody, just can you at least get one takeaway, learn one thing? And I'm really looking forward to hearing what they're what they're thinking about. And really, because so many of the members here uh, that are joined are part of these organizations, so I can't really uh, can't wait to hear uh, what things we're going to talk about. I'm sure we'll. We'll talk a lot about the national driver shortage. Hopefully one day, we're not gonna be talking about that, but today that's obviously a regular theme and we're gonna be discussing clever ways, perhaps how to chip away at that driver shortage. And of course, there'll be other uh, themes that we've not discussed in the past. So stay tuned because a lot of good things. And listen, these webinars are really get excited when you participate so there's an area where it's got the question and answers just get in there start typing in there whether it's questions or maybe there's some topics you really you want to, us to talk about in the future please do that that's how we grow and uh special weekend this weekend coming up here uh many of you know my family moved to this country from italy when i was a little kid and i'm ultra grateful that I was, I was able to come here, uh, build a whole future because I became American, I'm a US citizen, and it's a special weekend, uh, just to really for all those men and women that served our country and gave their lives for our freedom. So I just wanna make sure that sometime this weekend, we're all busy, just take a moment and reflect all that and let's be grateful for what we have, because take it from me, majority of the world is not as good as we have it here so i just always want to express gratitude and i know many of you if not all of you feel the same way so again get back on track right rick i can feel you kicking me through the no, bottom no, no, you're good <laughs> i can feel you kicking me like keep on going but let's do this uh remember everything's always going to be recorded off transfer.com you can see it so rick how about you take over and uh Let's go ahead and introduce our panelists. I'm, I'm super excited. Thank you so much, Tony. Yes, we got a great panel. I'm gonna ask, uh, as I say your name, just pop on screen. Um, first up, Bill Andexler. He's the Educational Services Center of Northeast Ohio. He was also recently named out of Ohio. He was the Transportation Director of the Year. So congratulations, Bill, on that. You have a lot of insights. I appreciate you joining us. Next up is Dave Christopher. He's with NIAP, New York Association for People Transportation. I gotta give Bill a shout out. Bill was my partner in crime for, I don't know how many years now doing these. Um, and it was meeting, catching up with Bill at a uh, NIAP workshop where he said, Rick, I would like to have a webinar featuring some executive directors that are in the same role that Dave's in and hear their thoughts on things. So we aim to please Dave. So thanks for the idea, it was a great one. Um, on the national level, we have Molly McGee Hewitt, uh, National Association for People Transportation. We've already had her on a few times now. She's a rock star. She's been with uh, NAPT for since November and uh, doing amazing things there. So thanks so much for joining us, Molly. We have Rana Weber with, everyone says NASDIPS. I'm gonna say the whole thing though. National Association of State Directors of Pupil Transportation. Thank you, Rana, for joining us. Marissa Weisinger with uh, TAPT, Texas Association for People Transportation. Thank you so much for joining us as well. And I'm Rick DeRico, I'm the Director of Public Relations at TransFinder. Um, before we get started, Tony mentioned that Q&A box there where we really do like to hear your, your thoughts, your participation, participation. 
and I will try to bring those issues in and throw them out. If you have a specific question for one of the panelists, I'll make sure I identify that. Like Molly, what do you think about this? Great. Or if you say, I want to open it up to any of the panelists, go ahead and, and send that as well. Or you have your own thoughts about, well, here's what we've done that's worked. So um, I want to also just test that everybody knows how to use that Q&A box. So if you could just quickly tell me, where are you logging in from to join us today? Um, you can either say the city and state, but at least put the state in. I'd like to just see those things pop up. So if you could do that, that'd be great. First one up, Lincolnshire. Anthony Mendoza, who's on our, our Stop Finder webinar uh, last week. Awesome. Anthony, you win. You're number one on the list. Um, we are Illinois is winning so far. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, uh, Pennsylvania. Now, where's Gerald ISD? Michigan, I see. Um, okay. So they're all popping up. This is great stuff. I just love it. Tony started doing this a long time ago with like, what's the weather in your neighborhood? And I always thought it was just fun to watch these things grow. Minnesota, Indiana, New York. Um, I love it. I love it. So anyway, so Bridget, if you can go to the next slide for a moment, uh, actually keep this slide. All right, there you go. Keep that up. We're going to, I want to have everybody go around the room. We're going to just talk a little bit about who you are and your role. We'll try to keep this a little bit on the short side, but you know, who, who you are, your role, what you're doing. Bill, I know you've got a new role, so I'd like to, if you could share that. And then, um, we're, and then we'll get into some of these hot button issues that we're going to be discussing today. So I'm going to start with Bill, David, Molly, Rana, and Marissa. That's how you guys line up on my screen. And then we'll jump into it. So Bill, tell us a little bit about you and, and your role. All right, thanks, Rick. Um, I've been in the transportation business for over 23 years. Um, started out with the small schools and I ended up at Akron Public Schools, which is the fifth largest in, uh, in Ohio. And just about two weeks ago, um, I was fortunate enough to land a new position at the Educational Service Center of Northeast Ohio as a transportation consultant. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to put consultants, we're trying to put people back into the ESCs to help the supervisors in the state of Ohio. Great, thanks so much. And you, you're bringing transportation kind of, you said it's, it's almost a return to what it used to be in the past to bring it back to make transportation front and center. Right, years ago, uh, Ohio had uh, 88 educational service centers. We're down to 51 and 20, 20 years ago, they used to have somebody in the ESCs that the transportation supervisor, supervisors would report to um, and touch base with them. But over the years, they've gotten away from that and we're, we're trying to bring it back in uh, right. to the ESCs. Very good, thank you. David. Thank you, Rick, uh, glad to be back after uh, uh, two years of doing this with you and uh, just like old hat again. Uh, it is. I'm Dave Christopher, Executive Director of uh, the New York Association for Pupil Transportation. Uh, I am a retired transportation director. I had my first gig in 1982, worked in small schools, city schools, big suburban schools, and retired in 2014 and had a few different uh, jobs in between uh, uh, what I'm doing now and proud to be the executive director of the New York Association and uh, been here since 2018. So uh, uh, glad to be here today as well. I can't say enough about Dave. I don't want to embarrass him, but he's a great leader. It's been great to really get to know him and he's just tops, really is tops. Molly. Yeah. You're muted, yes. Hello, uh, and it's great to be back with uh, with you all at TransFinder and with this great panel. I'm Molly McGee Hewitt. I'm the CEO Executive Director of NAPT. I've been with them, as uh, Rick mentioned, since November, but I've been an educator, administrator, association person in the education world for over 30 years. Uh, and I have a passion for this industry and I have a passion for what we're doing. And NAPT really has three functions. One is professional development. The second is legislative and policy uh, advocacy. And the third is really raising public awareness to safety issues uh, that impact our student transportation industry. So all of this sort of fits into what we're doing today. And I'm excited to be on this panel with this great group of professionals. So thank you. Thanks so much, Molly. Rana. 
Welcome. I'm Rana, Weber. I'm Rana Weber. I'm the executive director of NASDIPS, the State Directors Association. And state directors can come from either the Department of Education, Department of Transportation, or law enforcement. So it's important to know where your state director falls in your state and know how best to work with them in your student <laughs> transportation. But I'm thrilled to be here. I've been in uh, school transportation for about 25, 27 years. I started out as a federal lobbyist and worked with uh, the National School Transportation Association for a number of years. Um, but I'm happy to be with NASDIPS and delighted to be here today with Transminder. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And mm -hmm. last but definitely not least, Marissa. Good morning, everybody. My name is Marissa Weisinger and I am the executive director for the Texas Association for Pupil Transportation. Um, I did have a stint, Bill, uh, for about six years at our local education service center, where our focus was mostly professional development and support for the school districts, and I really enjoyed my time there. I think, as others have said, I'm, I'm passionate about professional development, and so I'm, I'm, I always enjoy that involvement. Um, I am a prior director of transportation. Um, I've been the executive director for Texas since 2015. And I'm excited about this panel and looking forward to uh, what everybody has to say. So thank you for inviting me. Thanks so much. And Bill, so there's a, a resource right there that maybe help you in your as you move into this new role. Um, thank you so much. Oh, I have a question already from the web from the panels I want to get to in a second. But I did promise that I was going to make a reference to. I I mentioned how we have a numeral one and that this is the part one roundtable. Um, we had an amazing dry run the other day, and you can see just some of the topics that came up. Um, and so these these webinars are always focused on solution oriented, but sometimes you have to set the table and deal with the issues. And and so it's not meant to be you know a, you know a downer, but it is like these are some issues that we see some headwinds coming up. We have that you see that little logo there for the SWOT analysis that stands for those of you who don't know strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Today, we'll probably talk about threats. That might be a little bit of a strong word, but just concerns, things that are maybe, you know, in the future that how do we deal with a mandate or, or some other type of issue. So that doesn't mean we're not gonna hit solutions today. The panelists, like I said, you know, don't feel bad if we hit some solutions today, that's gonna be great. But we needed, we felt like as we were going through this dry run that we're probably gonna need to get together again. And um, so we have uh, the second part of this round table is gonna be, in June, uh, I believe it's June 29th, and that's actually coming right off of TAPT, Marissa, I was warned. So I appreciate you doing that right after having one of your conferences. So I just gotta give you a shout out for that. Um, so anyway, so please mark your calendars. And again, we're gonna hit solutions on both of these, but, and also in between then, if you have questions or topics you wanna make sure we embed into the next webinar too, you could definitely drop me an email. Okay. So here's the question from Mark, who asked, before we even get started with this hot button issues we have listed here, how many of the panel members uh, have had boots on the ground at, as drivers at some point? So how many of you have been a school bus driver? And if so, and if you were a driver, how long were you a driver? Marissa? Um, I was a driver. Um, I, um, I had been an office manager in Dallas and um, was involved in a car accident. <laughs> and I actually just wanted to find some little stress-free job. And so a friend of mine said, uh, well, come, come." actually she said, come ride as an attendant on a special needs bus four hours a day. And so I thought, well, I can do that. And so what she didn't tell me was that all attendants had to get their CDL. And so the rest is history. I fell in love with it. and um, I think that was one of the things that helped me as a director is because I had driven, I had been a trainer, I had been a dispatcher and a router and all those things. And so I think that gave me that background to understand what my staff were going through. Well, you see, I think we already hit a solution right there. Driver shortage, number one, personal recruitment. Number two, less information is better. <laughs> you don't have to paint the big picture and just, hey, become an aide. You don't even need to think about driving, just become an aide. So I think we've already got us. I think we've already can check mark some some solution. That's really great, Marissa. Who else has been a, a driver and how long? I'll I'll step up. Uh, I'll tell you how it worked out with me. I got out of college in 1981, didn't have a job. That should be recalled. Jobs are hard to find in 1981. And a uh, person that I had worked for for several years, cleaning buses, if you can believe that, 
as a kid said, hey, come on back and work for me and uh, you'll get health insurance. And uh, we'll complement that job with a job in my business. He had a private business. And uh, that's what I did for two years. And then I went on to become a manager at a uh, uh, school in the Syracuse area. So uh, the lesson learned there is provide good benefits because that's what attracted me. And, and, and partner uh, the job as a bus driver, which is typically four or five hours a day, right? With another kind of a job. And that's how you attract people. And I was a young person. I was 21 years old. And, uh, you know, we, we talk all the time about how to get young people into this business. And I think that's how you have to do it. You have to, you have to pay well and provide some benefits and try to uh, uh, combine the job with other kinds of work that uh, fills the day for drivers. And I, I think we'd be more successful attracting drivers if we looked at it that way. And schools that are doing that are successful. Well, Mark just gave you a kudos on that. He said, Dave hit the nail on the head for recruitment. And I think the, both co the common theme of both Marissa and Dave is also that personal touch. Um, people are more likely to come alongside if I'm asking someone that I know, you know, hey, you might like this, you know, give it a shot. And they like you and they go, well, I like you, maybe, and you like it, maybe I will like it. Um, Bill, you were a driver as well, correct? Uh, not, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't consider myself a driver. Um, I, I was in the private sector for 25 years. Uh, I ran machine, I was in a machine shop. I used to kill trees. I was a tree climber. And then one day my wife uh, came home and said, hey, I heard that the supervisor at transportation at our local school uh, gave us two weeks notice. And, and at that time, I, I just said, so how's that affect me? Two months later, I, was start, I started out as a supervisor. And then about two months later, I became certified to drive a bus. Um, but I never actually, I won't consider myself an actual bus driver. I can drive a bus, drive with students. Um, I could fill in when needed, um, but I, it's, I never had a route uh, assigned to me. Okay. All right. Before we get started going into these issues, we've already touched on these already a little bit. Um, I, we do have a poll question for the attendees. Um, so it's going to deal with some of these issues mentioned here. Um, Bridget, could you pull up the poll question? Um, we want to get a sense of what issues are the top issues that you're facing. We couldn't put all those there, but we'll combine a couple. So driver slash mechanic shortage, staffing turnover, state mandates, student management issues. That's a euphemism, I think, for discipline. It's a nice way to put it. And safety issues uh, could be a variety. Uh, one of the ones that came up was illegal passing. So if you could punch in your, uh, your vote there. And then I'll just go to um, the panel and get a sense from them of, you know, what's what's the top issue you guys want to talk about before we get to the others? I mean, um, Rana, what's 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 on your your top your top list? You know, I, the driver and, and mechanic shortage has to be number one. I mean, that that affects everything else. Um, unless we can get the kids to school and get the buses moving, then we don't we don't get to deal with any of the other issues. Um, so that's clearly number one, and, and unfortunately, something we're still stuck dealing with. And we talked a little bit about this the other day, about some departments that are pretty much requiring their <laughs> mechanics to drive as well. And that actually is hurting even some of the recruitment, maybe, for mechanics, because maybe they don't want to be a driver. Is that correct, Rana? I think it probably is. I mean, you know, you, you would want your mechanics to be able to move your bus around. So I understand from a district perspective, wanting the flexibility, um, but your drivers probably, you know, may not want to be out driving kids. So I, I get that side of it too. Um, but, you know, when you're in a shortage, everything and every possible solution is important. So um, looking for as much flexibility as possible is often, you know, where, where a district's going to head. Molly, I want to go to you too because we got you guys are the national figureheads here for us. More than figure, I don't mean figurehead like queen. I mean like you guys are the ones that have the big national picture. Molly, what would you say? Uh, I know you you talked about the shortage, but you had some other thoughts as well about top priorities. I think you're muted again. 
Sorry about that. Uh, I, ob I obviously would agree with the shortage, and I think it is huge. And I think we also have to look at that second issue we talked about, which was just staffing changes, where even in the leadership of transportation departments, whether it's our directors, our routers, our trainers, mechanics, bus drivers, we are getting retirements and we are getting a lot of turnover. So I think that that is, is hugely important for us. I think the, the thing that keeps me up most at night after the driver shortage would probably be regulatory relief and would be all of the issues that, that our state and, our, and at the federal level that we're facing. As a matter of fact, I'm in Washington, D.C. today and I'm at the World Resource Institute at a advisory meeting on electric uh, vehicles. And so it's, it's quite interesting to me to see all of these groups coming together to look at some of these issues. And I think one of the parts that I see is we are not alone in this. We need to look outside just our own local organizations, our local school districts, and realize that some of the issues that we're facing are just, they're not, they're nationwide, but they're also impacting us in so many different areas. So I would say the second area that really keeps me up at, at the national level would be the regulatory relief. So, and when you're there, are you um, helping to maybe, is it to find more funding for that or to say uh, longer well, time? Think, uh, right. Or? Well, you know, uh, electric buses are uh, a federal mandate right now with the EPA and what they have given in the recent grant program. And so there's a lot of issues and there's a lot of, I would say there's a definite split in the transportation industry of people who are either pro electric school buses or people who wish to continue with diesel and other alternative uh, fuels. And so, you know, one of the parts of this is just being able to understand and speak on behalf of NAPT, on behalf of our membership, of looking at the issues that they're facing. And so, you know, whenever there's grants and whenever there's a push, it starts, it usually doesn't come organically from our, our members and from the people in the field. It usually comes from on high uh, to us. And even in school districts, when a district is considering electric buses, it's probably not something that is coming necessarily from the transportation department. It's probably coming from the school board and the superintendent. And so regulatory issues, I, I know a lot of times people in student transportation feel it is done to them as opposed to it is done with them. And so I guess my, my being here and the role in these different visual, uh, what are they, these different organizations that have visibility at the <clears throat> national level we play is to really try to speak on behalf of our members and to really reflect their needs, wants, and desires. And you feel like you're being heard. Yeah, I do feel like we're being heard. I think in some ways it's a little bit of an uphill struggle. And you know, if you're a transportation director in a district, you may not be what is an executive staff or cabinet level administrator in that district. And we have a lot of incredibly talented people in transportation that are really good leaders who lead incredible divisions uh, of what they're doing. They might have millions of dollars worth of equipment and hundreds of employees, and yet they sometimes hit what I call the middle manager ceiling, where they are, are in a position where they don't have the authority or they don't have the voice that they need. And I think one of the things that we want to do is we want to make sure that they do have the voice and that it is heard. And I am grateful that we are having doors open to us, whether it's the EPA, EPA NTSB. I know my colleagues like uh, Rona at NASDIPS and NSTA, we are making the connections that I think we need to make, but we still have a ways to go. Awesome. You know, yeah, Rick, I could, I could just go ahead. You're, you're my next. Uh, I think Molly's got a great point, because if you look at some of these hot button issues on our list here, driver shortage, stress on leadership, student management issues, Many of these are caused in part uh, because of intense regulation. And many of our members tell us that uh, because of you know the, the CDL that came down the road many years ago, entry level driver training, uh, you know, intense state regulation, uh, they, they've just they've had enough. They can't get people into the business because there's so many hurdles, so many hoops that you have to jump over. Uh, to to get people qualified and to keep them qualified, uh, that uh, that's that's part of the reason for the driver shortage because because there's just a lot to it and you can go out and and find another job driving for 
uh, another company that requires less of, of the regulation. So I think Molly's got it right on that some of the regulation that uh, I believe was put in place for you know good intents, good intentions, uh, probably is a major reason why we're facing some of the challenges we face today. That's interesting that it's not just a individual decision to say, I don't want to drive a bus anymore, it's less attractive. But I mean, it's not attractive, but it is because of some of the issues you guys just raised. That it's. You tell you, I got my license at at uh, 18, by the way, uh, and drove at 21. The regulation that I had to deal with was significantly less than what you have to deal with today. And certainly, since many of those things are necessary, we want safe buses and safe drivers on the road. But you might ask yourself, have we gone too far in some regards? That's good. You also talked the other day, Dave, about specifically about uh, electric buses and the mandate that New York State is facing, and also your concern about whether there not being enough money, literally, to fund these. It actually could be if districts making choices between do we hire a teacher, do we get a new school bus? Yeah, yeah. there's clearly not enough money to do what uh, uh, we need to do by 2035. And uh, we're, we're convinced that unless that changes, and we're hopeful that will, because there's certainly, understand there's some advantages to electric vehicles. Uh, we're not diesel people, as some folks coin us you know, to be. Uh, we, we believe that uh, it may impact the ability of school districts to deliver the service. And in fact, uh, some may make choices uh, and, and change their eligibility policy so that they can avoid spending 400 to $450,000 for a school bus and thousands and thousands of dollars of infrastructure or hire a teacher. Uh, we really believe that that's, that's something that down the road will be considered. And uh, we want to try to avoid that. If we're going to do electric vehicles, then it has to be properly funded. Rana, you mentioned something I want to get to. I'm, Bill, I'm going to go to you next after Rana about uh, Ohio and some of the struggles that you talking about, like late buses and that kind of stuff, because I think there's an issue there as well. I know you could talk for multiple webinars you're going to have to keep it tight, but it's some good stuff there, I think. But Ron, I want to talk to you because you're the last item that brought this up um, and, and that last bullet point. I thought, it, you know, we're talking about electric buses, but also talking about the use of the change. You talked about the changing. I think that's your phrasing, I think, the changing definition of a bus. And that's a concern for you. And I know that other districts are trying to find ways to increase more drivers and maybe go to a smaller bus. But are they as safe? Um, are the drivers going through the same rigorous, um, I don't want to steal too much, but just your thoughts about the changing definition of a bus as well and your thoughts on that. Several states have looked at that. It gives them a bit more flexibility. Can they move to a passenger vehicle? Can they move to a, a passenger van or a minivan or a suburban type vehicle? Some are using taxi cabs or using a whole variety of vehicles in place of an actual, as we all know, the yellow iconic school bus. Um, you know, obviously there's the concerns with that from, from the vehicle safety perspective. Is it being inspected? Is it being regulated by this, the appropriate transportation education uh, department within the state and going through the same requirements there? There's also the driver concerns. Is the driver being screened as a traditional school bus driver is screened? Um, and, and do the parents even recognize that there's a difference? There's a lot of moving parts to that. and and something that we're certainly very mindful of um, as that trend continues to grow across the country. Very good, thank you. Yeah, we've done a lot of webinars and um, that first came up, I don't know, it was a couple of years ago about the smaller buses <laughs> and that, that you don't need the CDL. But then I know, I think New York State still requires you to have the CDL and others. So it's just an interesting, you kind of understand the approach, Tony, I mean, um, David mentioned, you know, good intentions, but sometimes that, you know, it, it could have a negative, you know, an un, what's, it, what's the expression now? Unintended consequence. So, right. um, Bill, Ohio, uh, we love Ohio, by the way, um, but some pretty strict, uh, you know, mandates regarding, you know, getting um, on-time buses and, and that have had an, a significant impact. You talked specifically about Columbus getting a huge amount of money clawed back because of late buses. And is there, can I set the table for that a little bit, but also is there a move to try to maybe um, soften some of those regulations? Uh, 
Yes, there is. Um, but going back to your poll question about the drivers, of course, driver shortages is the number one, but some of the driver shortages is because of the student behavior. Uh, the drivers don't want to deal with the kids anymore because it seems like it's really escalated after the COVID. Um, and why is that? I don't have the answer to that, but our uh, conducts have gone way up since then. It just seems like there's no respect anymore uh, for the driver or the adults or anything anymore. So those are the, those are the two top things for the district that I used to run. Um, and leading up to what you're saying right now is about Ohio with their, our legislators have passed some laws and there is one moving through the books right now. Um, but they, they passed, it was two years ago as House Bill uh, 110. And what it is, it's, it has to deal with charter and non-public schools. And in Ohio, we're, you know, we're required to transport to charter and non-public schools um, within 30 minutes of our, of the home school. And everybody knows things happen out on the road. It could be an accident, it could be railroad crossings, it could be students late to come coming out to the bus. Um, and again, with the driver shortages, you know, everybody's doing what they can, they're doubling up, you know, the routes and things like that. So Ohio legislators passed a, on House Bill 110 is that if you could be in non-compliance. And if you're in non-compliance, non-compliance could be if you're like one second late past the scheduled bell time. Mm -hmm. So again, you're going to be late. Sometimes you're, you know, 15, 20 minutes late. And then if you're 10 times in one semester, they will take 10 times the amount of your reimbursement from the state. So Akron's reimbursement per day would be about $26,000 per day from the state. You mentioned Columbus. Columbus is the largest school district in Ohio. Their reimbursement for the, per day is $166,000 per day. They, they have 700 bus drivers you know, in Columbus. So if you get this money clawed back because you're late, that could add up considerably. So in Akron, if, you, if you're late 10 times, that's you know $260,000 that's clawed back. Right now they're in court, uh, Columbus and a few other schools are in court because Columbus had $11 million clawed back from them. And of course they took, you know, they're, they're in court over that. Now we have some new legislation that's moving through, um, kind of piggyback on that. And, you, and you're on the House Bill 110 and you brought up about the vans. Now Ohio does have, we can transport students with vans in the vans. Um, right now we cannot transport regular ed students to and from school. We can do athletics, we can do special ed, we can do homeless. But now there's some talk that there we can do charter and non-public only. Can't do our public kids, but we can do charter and non-public with fans. So that's kind of moving through. So in the next month, we should have a, uh, they should be voting on that. Just interesting to see the impact that, and then you wonder, you know, the first question I had uh, that somebody asked me to ask you guys, uh, Mark, was, how many were drivers or how many are in transportation? How many of our lawmakers have been in transportation to understand some of the, yeah, there you go. Marissa, Bill touched on a topic you brought up uh, during our dry run. So I want to see if you want to pick up a little bit. You talked about, well, two things, but one you talked about was um, student management um, issues and um, that you, you put it very nicely. It's, it's different since COVID, I think is how you put it, um, but it's based some, some struggles there. You also mentioned um, early learning driver training. So mm -hmm. I wanted to, you want to touch on those issues as well. But um, your thoughts on, on um, specifically on the, the discipline issues. Yeah, you know, Rick, when I saw the poll list, I saw a direct correlation between driver retention and student management. And we hear it so much, uh, even in surveys, that the number one reason that drivers leave is not so much pay as the fact that they don't feel like they get support from on the campus level. And so when we talk about student management rather than student behavior, 
you know, a lot of times it's training. If we've got drivers that ride up kids frivolously, you know, sometimes that uh, lack, demeans the respect that maybe the campus level that they get. So I think there's a big push on our side to show support and training and to work with the campuses to give these drivers the support that they need when they do ride up the student and some very creative things. You know, of course, if you have principal rides on the bus that day, they're going to behave. But, you know, encouraging them to maybe, you know, watch some video of some efforts. But training, you know, we, we talk about management because it's got to start before the behavior ish happens. And so um, you're talking about challenges and opportunities. We cannot seem to offer our student management classes enough. Those those fill up immediately and there's just such a, a request for those because people really see a need. And what these classes do is they make the driver look at himself. He's got 70 different personalities on the bus. And how does his personality reflect on that? It, and, it, you know, it all goes with age and everything else. So I think that that's a big thing as far as retention. Um, keep, let's keep, hold on to those drivers that we have. Yes, we can't hire new ones, but we need to really find ways that we can hold on to them. Um, on the ELDT side, um, you know, our larger districts will probably already have all these things in place that, that were required. I think the more difficult side of that was some of the smaller districts who may not have had that dedicated person you know, they just grab a bus driver to come in and say, hey, we've got a new driver, you know, a veteran driver, they're a good driver, will you train this new person? And so they're struggling with getting those processes into place. We, we've seen issues where uh, not more than one person was designated as the, in the TPR registry, you know, and so then that person leaves and then they're stuck with not being able to access or get in and, and document information. We've been, we've had several classes. We've taken them around the state to help these um, districts, you know, with this. And we still continue to do it, even though we've been doing it now for quite a while. So <clears throat> that's probably a couple of the issues that we're seeing that we're trying to help districts with. That's great. Yes, go ahead, Molly. You know, one of the things I think that this really goes down to a, an issue that has been in education since I was a student many moons ago and through my tenure in different positions, and that is we are so siloed sometimes in school districts. And rather than seeing it as one team that is all working together for student achievement, we see different divisions. And sometimes we put one group above another. I often say there's sort of a caste system uh, in it, that if you're in, if you're in the uh, instructional side of the house, you have four stars above your head. And if you're in the transportation side or others, you might have one. And what one of the things that we really have to do is we have to get everyone from school teachers and bus drivers and principals and everyone valuing what each other does. And I think for transportation folks, a lot of times I have heard I have heard incredible stories of people who have been very disrespected doing a very professional job in a very professional way. And I think that that's a societal issue a little bit right now, because I think there's sort of a mean spiritedness on the face of the earth. But until we look at education, and I am so grateful that I had the opportunity to work for some superintendents who said, we treat everyone with dignity and respect, and they practice that. It's not separated out. It's not those silos. And it, it takes more than just, you know, it's great. You know, when I was an administrator, I did ride the bus on occasion, um, but it took more than that. It more than something that is an action of a one-time action. It's about integrating a different level of support and appreciation throughout the organization. And I think that's huge in education today. You know, one of the um, the things that uh, uh, I, I don't try to do commercials, but I do have to mention one thing about, we have a thing called Form Finder, which is part of our Route Finder Plus product, but maybe there's other products out there, but um, where you could do student discipline issues that it can be shared with the teachers or vice versa. Wouldn't it be great if a teacher has a student that's been acting up? That's not typical. Maybe Tommy, we've seen some behavior with Tommy. Maybe there's something going on at home and the driver can know, oh, okay, now I have my, my antenna up and, and maybe just Tommy needs a little more attention to say, hey, how are you doing today? Or vice versa. Wouldn't it be nice to know going into the classroom, the teacher would know, hey, had some issues um, I don't know how instantaneously, but it could be that day or the next day before the week goes by that this little boy is not falling through the cracks, this little girl, Sally, is not falling through the cracks, that 
this is not usual. This is not our typical person, you know, issue. So maybe there's something that we just need to to reach out to. So that kind of goes to your point too, Molly, about like four stars versus one star and that kind of thing and saying, hey, look at if the, you know, I've heard many of our presenters talk in the past, like many times that bus driver is the first smile they may have gotten that day. I hate to say it, to think that a parent is not that first smile for that child, but unfortunately it probably is for some kids. And so they're the ones that are helping set that tone before they even walk in the doors of the school. So um, anyway. And Rick, sometimes, a lot of times, my experience is it's not the kids either, it's the parents is is the problem. I mean, they, they come to the bus ready to fight right off, you know, yeah. they, don't, they don't come to the bus to talk and to, to discuss what's going on. They, they, they're ready to fight as soon as they come to the bus. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, administrative support too, I'll give you a perfect example of support's kind of what Molly was saying in one of my districts. We used to keep track of the discipline referrals at each school and uh, at administrative staff meetings, we, we roll out those numbers. And we had one particular principal who consistently had low number of discipline referrals for bus drivers. And the reason with that, for that was because every morning, without exception, she was on the bus board meeting the buses as they came in and gave the drivers a significant amount of, of support that uh, you know other schools didn't receive. And she took care of problems right then and there, and the kids knew it. And it was a very successful program on her part, and it worked. It was support and follow-up. You know, I just thought of a crazy idea. I, I, I know that there are teachers and principals and even superintendents who have driven buses. I don't know if you could legally do this or not, so maybe this is a really dumb idea. So I'll throw it out. How about swap job days? You know, a driver goes into the classroom so he gets a feeling or she gets a feeling of what it's like. That's a tough job too, teaching. And then, but you know, I don't know, maybe that wouldn't be legal, I don't know. But I know that when principals and teachers drive the bus, they probably have a little bit more of an affinity to that role that you guys are fulfilling than those that don't drive. So just a thought. I think, I think it's fair to say though, the disrespect and this, the intense student management issues that we've seen occur in the classroom as well as on the bus. And we really need to prepare our people to deal with that. I think, you know, I think Marissa hit on the head more training. And I think we need to look at professional development. For example, many of our members fight uh, to, to be able to attend a conference or to take classes. And so it is not something that is just uh, like a, a, a something that you just expect where there are professional development happens in school districts all across the country, but we tend to center it around instruction and curriculum where it needs to be expanded out, or we need to at least allow our folks to have those same opportunities. And, you know, I, I think about when you hire a person to drive a bus, you're hiring them to do more than just drive that bus, right? You know, they, they are wearing many hats in that. And so getting that initial certification and what they need to be able to drive is just the first step. But being able to manage the parents, managing those kids on your bus, managing the changes that are happening in our equipment, et cetera, those are pretty challenging for every day to, to deal with. And then when uh, Marissa mentioned about since COVID, I think that people have forgotten some of their social graces or have forgotten some some parts about going on a bus or how to be in a classroom. And our teachers will tell you the same thing, that, that it is a very different uh, group of people that we're working with right now that have very different expectations. You know, riding on a bus is not um, something that children learn like walking and talking. And sometimes parents don't think about that. And um, districts who encourage their drivers to have those relationships with the parents early on, introducing themselves, I'm gonna be your, um, your child's uh, uh, driver and you know anything you can tell me about Johnny uh, those things are really important you know communication skills confidentiality and those kind of things uh, a lot of um, training opportunities there that I think would would help the drivers I just thought of two things so one was we had a panel a year ago maybe or two years ago it was all drivers they, they, they weren't executive directors or um, transportation supervisors and who happened to drive. They were literally, that's what they were, were drivers. I think we had four or five. And um, yes, we did kind of say, let's try to keep it positive, okay? So 
um, I did kind of skew that toward that because we kind of wanted this to be even a potential um, recruitment tool, which I'll make available. I'll send it to you all um, so you have it. We'll put it on Facebook as well. Um, and they did talk about the rewarding aspects of it. Um, and just years later, some kid that they may have had in kindergarten or middle school coming back from college and running into them at the grocery store and saying, Mrs. So-and-so, you were the best driver and you were the one that gave me that smile in the morning and that, all that kind of stuff. So just that there is more to it. It is a con. But here's a thought I just had. Um, Can I just speak to that, though? That's a good point. And I want to go back to a survey that my predecessor did in concert with School Boards Association. Uh, they did a survey of school bus drivers, and the school bus driver said, this is the best job I've ever had. You know, I'm, I'm summarizing. The report's on our website if you want to read. They also interviewed people in, in the public domain, and they said, I never do that job. I, I don't want to deal with students. It's too risky. I don't want to. So there's a disconnect between the actual job and what the bus drivers feel in terms of the job and what the public perceives as, as the job. And somehow we have to fix that because yes. that's why people don't come in with okay. their application on the desk. Bus drivers, many of which you know, I, I've talked to in retirement, so I really like that job. I like the kids, I like the freedom. The money wasn't bad, you know. Certainly, they had other things to support themselves with, but uh, so there's a disconnect there, and we need to fix that. Yeah, so and you know, recently on the NAPT side, we had a conversation about. Um, yes, there are some bad things that are happening out there, you know, like um, Molly brought up her concern with um, so many injuries to bus drivers and some of the things, the assaults and the attacks. And so, you know, what came out of that conversation is we see so much of that on the news, but we're not seeing the positive stuff. You know, like uh, okay. I remember my bus driver and it's because of my bus driver, I'm where I am today. And bus drivers who drive 30, 40, 50 years and never have an accident and those sort of things. We need more PR. We need more positive um, re reflections of what the bus driver job could be. I agree with you 100 percent on the the positive part um, and that's something I've been trying to encourage in Northeast Ohio is um, get out get the good news out to your local newspaper then your local uh, person and then even go out to the media get the TV try to get the positive out as much as you can because the negative goes out very easily it's hard to get the positive out so just keep you don't have to work to get the negative out <laughs> no it, it, it comes and finds you very quickly um, but in Ohio, my experience is that a lot of the districts do not allow transportation to talk to the media. Mm -hmm. Okay, it always has to be the superintendent or uh, the district uh, communication person. Um, I was fortunate where I was at, um, they allowed me to talk to the media and we I talked probably six, seven times a year. And they would come out and do live shots right out, you know, at our gate and things like that. And we always try to do the positive. And if you if you build that relationship with the media, and unfortunately, when you do have something that is bad, you may not get, you know, thrown under the bus as bad. You know, they'll they'll if you want to talk to them, that because they're they're just doing their job. They just want to get a story, and but make a relationship with the media and and that they're more than happy to, to post something for you yeah now you're preaching to the choir on that one um it is knowing news so you got to make it newsy but newsy doesn't have to be bad it can just be you know i mean the heroic stuff i love i see those on facebook we always try to reshare as many of those as we see there's so many amazing and yeah there are the ones that make you you probably all have a google alert that says bus driver i know i do and i see things i'm like oh boy but they're far and few between compared to the positive stuff, you know, but they just don't, they just don't make that noise. Here's a question or a thought. I mean, you know, teachers, when a new student comes in, they know who their new teachers are, especially when they're in the elementary school, they may even get to walk in the classroom and meet Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. Um, what would happen if like either kids, I know that some schools do this and then kids get maybe their first bus ride, they get to walk on the bus, what it's like to get on a bus, what's proper, but what about even like a little bio going out saying, this is so-and-so, I've been driving for three years, my favorite ice cream is strawberry, which is mine is not, by the way, mine's cookies and cream, but 
you know, those kind of things. Like, and just personalize them. It goes out. It could be an email. If you have a parent app, it could go in the parent app. This is going to be your driver. And just could that help? I mean, you know, I always say, you know, it goes to, you know, the communication. I think um, Marissa was talking about communication. Um, and it's it's like uh, uh, building. It's a relationship building. You're kind of like and then you're making the other thing for me is make everybody a rock star. Well, yeah, you're going to have some shy drivers. that are going to like, OK, I'll give you my bio. But here's my three sentences. But there are going to be some that are going to get into it. So maybe it makes them feel more connected. Just a thought, an idea. Rana, I'm, I'm looking at Rana right now. You're one of those people that I would say, look, deep, uh, was it still waters run deep? So I want to get whatever, what are you thinking about right now? Because we talked about a lot of things, but I haven't been able to hear from you. So I want to get your thoughts of your take. You know, there's just so many things to focus on. And, and when you're facing the shortages and, you you know, you're running around and things are crazy, it's hard to uh, hard to focus on the things that are kind of out on the outer skirts. You're focused on the fire right in front of you. Um, but, you know, so many of the things in this list are, are top top tier for all of us every day. And, and you know, when funding changes in the state or or when priorities in the state change, like Dave talked about with EV, that's hard to keep up with. And it's, you know, it's really hard to um, to so, find your way through those issues. Remember the old vaudeville thing? I'm showing my age, but I don't really go back to vaudeville days. Just for people to know. But, <laughs> but like you're spinning multiple plates on a, on a stick and you and then you got to get to the last one before it falls to start the towel. You know what I'm Absolutely. talking about? Well, when you just talk around it, it made me think about that. Like, these are all top priority and we're going from one to the other and trying to keep it. But um, was somebody saying something that I didn't mean to talk over anybody? Was somebody jumping in on something? I think it comes back to leadership. I think that, you know, uh, it, this is, these are not jobs for the faint at heart. These are jobs for people with good uh, critical thinking skills, for people who can uh, project manage. And I, and I loved your idea of, of a parent getting a notice that, you know, Mr. Fred is your kid's bus driver, blah, blah, blah. My initial thought of that was who's gonna do it? Because we can't add one more thing in my estimation onto a transportation director at this moment because they may be going out and taking a route because they don't have enough drivers or they've got these issues. And so somehow building the leadership capacity and, and being able to do those things you know, I always say there's need to know versus nice to know. And the need to knows right now are on this list in front of us. The nice to knows are the things we're talking about. They're important. I'm not saying they're not important. But if I don't have enough drivers for route or I've got these hot issues happening, that's where my focus is. I think Ron is absolutely right. There's just, where, where do we go? Do we need one more tier one issue or where, where is it that we're going? It's the tyranny of the urgent, right? I mean. But sometimes the back end can solve the top problem, even though it seems like you're going in a secondary thing. Like, yeah. you know, um, I don't know, we talked about recruiting and just that, you know, maybe there's something that seems like it's not the urgent, but that actually could solve an urgent issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Rick, when you talk about threats or challenges, uh, right now I think a big one is wellness. Um, in the transportation industry, we we make it happen. Uh, you want a UIL bus in five minutes? Sure, we'll do it. Even if I have to go drive it, what do you need? And so we make it happen. And unfortunately, we put ourselves last. And so we're, I think because of that, we're seeing people retire sooner than they normally would. I mean, many of us, you know, we, we could have retired several years before, but, you know, we enjoy what we do. And so we stay on. We're not seeing that right now. We're seeing people counting <laughs> years and days and, and going to Austin to see, you know, when, when they can start their TRS. And so I think that's something, a point that we really need to focus on is making sure that our uh, administrative staff get that wellness and me time that they need. And That's I'm correct. number one, number one right here, you know, that I don't do that enough myself. That's good. You know, and I think and honestly, we, 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 we had a presentation from our, our local, uh, uh, our local group who, who deals with recruit recruitment of uh, just employment period. And one of the things that they said was that uh, you have to find a way to attract young people to this business because 
that's what a lot of industry is doing. They're reaching out, uh, like the you know engineers now are coming from OSI's classes, uh, technology classes, and we don't have the, really the ability to do that very well because uh, if a kid's in high school or just out of high school, there's not a lot he can do for us in terms of driving a bus until he's 21, right? So we lose him right after high school. So we have to find a way to try to bring those young people back into the business somehow who will one day be our supervisors, our leaders, our directors, and uh, uh, you know, work with them to improve those leadership skills. And good. Okay, that's a good point. And I think, by the way, just a reminder, next month we're gonna be talking, we had a lot of solutions, by the way. I feel like we covered a bunch of things. We're gonna get into a little bit more specifics. If there are certain links you can go to, to get training or some other um, best practice like bullet point, we're gonna really try to chuck full, knock off some of these, you know, here are some things to consider or look at all the attendees. I'm gonna definitely ask you to email us with any things that have worked for you so that next month we'll bring even, we'll just overwhelm everybody with a ton of solutions. I wanna go to the poll results and then I'm gonna go down the line. Dave, you remember this, we do the uh, top takeaway. Gotta keep it kind of short because we're, coming to the end, but I do want to hear your one. So you have time to think about this while Bridget will read us the uh, results, but give us one takeaway that you um, are going to want, um, like somebody who was in attendance, what they could bring back to the office. But first, Bridget, what are our results here? So top issues uh, being faced, 79% driver mechanic shortage, 63% student <laughs> management issues, 42% staffing turnover, 25% safety issues, illegal passing, uh, et cetera, and 4% state mandates. Okay, very good. And you know what's interesting about that, I guess, and we talked a lot about some of the mandate type issues, but the ones that they're talking about, I think, are some of the ones that they can maybe feel like they maybe have a, a little bit more control over. We don't have a lot of control over some mandates. I mean, you can lobby, you can put smart people like Molly out there and try to help them to and, you know, see the light, but some of these things, maybe you feel a little bit more like, maybe I can have some control over that. Maybe it's just a, putting a positive spin on there. I'm gonna, uh, one takeaway, Tony, you wanna come back on and give us your takeaway as well. I wanna go with Rana, Marissa, Molly, David, Bill, and then Tony will close us out. Uh, Rana, what's one takeaway that you want folks to, to have? And I got one from somebody on Bruce Berry, so we'll get him too. Go ahead, Rana. I think flexibility. I mean, there's so many, you know, these top issues are huge and, and they're all things that we need to not lose sight of. So I think being as flexible and nimble as you possibly can be is is really the best line of defense. Very good. Very good. Marissa. I, I agree with Rana and, um, you know, not letting how we prioritize all of these things uh, stresses to the max that we can't seem to face any of them and so um taking it one day at a time and and uh, understanding that other people are out there that can support us and help us with this also very good molly well i think i'm just always overwhelmed by the incredible professionalism and dedication of folks in the in the transportation industry and so when i look at this and i see that we we are all pretty much in agreement if you look at that list on what, what out there. So I think it's about, a little bit about perspective. And I do think when you bring good people together, good things can happen. And I think we just need to keep doing that and keep trying to move the needle a little bit every day. Very good. Very good. David. I think continue to improve your skill set. The job is not what it was, you know, many years ago. And a lot of new people are coming in. So I think you really need to take every opportunity to uh, uh, educate yourself, uh, network with people who know what they're doing in the business, been around and, and they know the business and uh, attend conferences, seminars, any anything you can do to uh, improve your skill set. And, and that's how uh, you move forward. That's great. Bill. Well, David took mine. Um, I was that was I was going to say that is that work. You're not in this alone. Reach out to your different groups. Um, in Ohio, we have OAPT, we have o OASBO, we, uh, we have OSBA, we have basically anything that begins with an O because that starts with Ohio or something. So, um, and even myself, you know, reach out to where I'm at now. That's what I'm. That's what I'm there for. That's what I'm in the ESC for, and is to help the supervisors. 
Um, so reach out and network and and our conference is coming up in, in June for the OABT conference. Very good. Tony. Be agile. It's really important. I think you need to be able to, you know, we're, we're already here and very smart people start thinking about what things could we change, what things are going to be the aha moment. You know, stop second guessing. I'm a true believer. If you want to get the answer, ask your employees, make an anonymous survey, and they'll tell you. We could second guess what they're thinking, but why do that? Just go and hit it. Ask them what's going to make things better. And guess what? People are brutally honest. So be agile at that point. Very good. Uh, Bridget, if you can go to the next slide, I'm going to read from Bruce's takeaway was administrators need to be involved and on the bus ramp when students are loading or unloading and take care of issues right there. So that's one of his takeaways. Um, Bridget, I don't know if you can move to the next slide. Um, the next webinar, so number one, if you have a story, um, we would love it if you could send us that story, just send it to uh, to my story at transfinder.com. That's my story at transfinder.com and we will definitely um, you know, reach out to you, see if you might wanna be a panelist and uh, so, and maybe even be a white paper or something. So we're always looking, and then anywhere you are in the country, we wanna hear what's working for you. The goal of these best practices is always to cultivate the best, uh, the best solutions. And then lastly, um, June 29th will be part two. And um, again, I think we hit a lot of solutions already, but June 29th will be the follow-up where we're gonna, um, talk to the same exact panel here, and they're gonna give us some more specifics on what you can do to solve these issues. But until then, I wanna thank our panelists, I wanna thank all of our attendees for uh, joining us, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.